Hey, we're in our Romans series. We're continuing today, so turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. And uh, we'll get to that portion of Scripture. We're going to start with verse 9. So if you just open your Bibles to Romans 12, we'll get there shortly. There's a quote that I came across this week from Oscar Hammerstein of Rodgers and Hammerstein. You've heard of them, great uh, Broadway musicals. Uh, he, He penned these words, To live in love with the saints above, oh, that would be glory. But to live below with the saints we know, oh, that's a different story. So today we're talking about love and uh, really, really, truly loving. But we continue in Romans, uh, specifically last week and this week we're in Romans chapter, Romans chapter 12. It's kind of a turning point in the letter of Paul's, church, uh, Paul's letter to the church at Rome. The first 11 chapters really teaches a lot of doctrine. And then in chapter 12 kind of turns a corner, uh, gets very practical and teaches how we should live our lives based on what is true. Last week, Pastor Austin started us in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, where Paul helps us to see that the only logical response to the mercies of God, when we consider everything that he has done for us, the only logical response is to offer our lives as a living sacrifice to God, to lay our bodies, to lay our lives on the altar of sacrifice to the Lord. This offering of ourselves involves transformation by rejecting worldly ways, not conforming or copying the behaviors or customs of the world around us, but letting God transform us from the inside out. See, the world is trying to conform us, to press us into a certain mold, but God's saying, what I want to do is transform you, transform you from the inside out. Out. And this leads us to an accurate self-assessment of ourselves, a, a, a right view of ourselves in God's sight so that, uh, as the scripture says in Romans 12, 3, that we don't think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. You see, we're all, as Christians, as believers, we're part of the body of Christ. And just like our physical bodies have many parts and with a variety of different functions that all work together for the common good of our body, so in Christ, though many parts we form one body, and every member, all of us, belong to, together. We're like one big jigsaw puzzle. Last Sunday night, I, I likened this to us, the church, as a jigsaw puzzle. We're all, we're all very different. We're all unique. We, we look different. We have different gifts. We have different abilities. But uh, we all connect together to serve a bigger plan, a bigger purpose uh, that God has. God has given us all different gifts Every one of you have different gifts, different abilities, different experiences in life, and we're all to use those gifts for loving and serving each other for the good of the body of Christ, his church. So it's at this point in Romans 12, starting at verse 9, where he uh, finishes out the chapter, he's going to be talking about love. And Romans 12, 9 says, don't just pretend to love others, really love them. That's the New Living Translation. The New Testament speaks a lot about loving others, about loving one another. John, 1 John three eleven says, this is the message that you have heard from the beginning that we should love one another. One of the primary, most often repeated messages in the early church was this command of Jesus to love one another. Jesus said to his disciples shortly before he went to the cross, John 13, 34, and 35, he said, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. I don't know if you've noticed, but the New Testament is filled with this one another language. Actually, I read something this week that there's probably a hundred different references in the New Testament to one another verses. Let me just, let me just read a few of them to you. You'll, you'll, you'll identify with these. Not only love one another, but be devoted to one another in love. Give preference to one another in honor. Regard one another as more important than yourselves. Subject, be subject to one another. Do not judge one another. Bear one another's burdens. Speak truth to one another. Do not lie to one another. Encourage and build up one another. Pray for one another. Be hospitable to one another. Be at peace with one another. Accept one another. Patiently tolerate one another. Be kind, tenderhearted, 
and forgiving to one another. That's just scratching the surface of how we are to live in response to uh, God's call to, to love and to be in relationship one another. And these one another verses, every single one of them, when it talks about how we are to be in relationship in this one anotherness, uh, it's all referencing fellow believers. So this isn't us loving the people outside. This is specifically talking about us, the church, loving each other. And so um, this is the context that we're looking at today. We're, we're a family. And there's a distinguishing mark of a follower of Jesus. And that is a deep, sincere, genuine love for brothers and sisters in Christ. If I ask you this question, do you love everybody in the room today? Do you love everybody that's joining us online? They're believers, they're followers of Jesus. And by, this, by the way, welcome to all of you who are online in our mask only service. I failed to recognize you all at the beginning. We're glad that you're here with us. First John 4, 21 uh, reminds us that he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. So by giving this command to love one another, Jesus did something that the world had never seen before. He created a group of people that would be identified specifically by love. There's a lot of different groups, especially in the world that we live in today, that have identifying marks. By the, the clothes that they wear or the, the values that they hold, a lot of different groups in the world, identifying themselves in a lot of different ways. But the church is unique. There is no other group that has love as their identifying mark other than the church. You see, in the church, with love as that hallmark, your skin color doesn't matter. Your native language doesn't matter. Your social status, your education, those things don't matter. Followers of Christ are simply identified by their love for each other. Jesus said, they will know that you are my disciples because you love one another. And I believe that we as a church, we at New Hope, we do a great job of loving other people. But I think that there's so much more that we can do. And what we've been through in this past year of COVID, where we've been separated and isolated and distanced and all of that, it's, it's caused us to fall into some routines that probably aren't quite as family-oriented as we want to be. I don't know if you realize this, but one year ago today was our first Sunday without people in the pews. We... we Heard the governor on the Saturday night at 10 o'clock, and that Sunday morning we canceled and we were doing online only, and that was one year ago today. I'm so thankful that we're here and that we can gather like this. So I think we do a good job, but I think there's room for growth. And I would think, I would love it if New Hope had this identifying claim that if, if you talk to somebody about New Hope in this city or in the surrounding area, they would say, New Hope, that's a church that really loves people really, really well. If that could be our mark, that would be one of the greatest compliments that you could give us. The early church was made up of people in Jerusalem from all over the known world. Those who had been saved got together and they immediately began meeting each other's needs. Acts 2, 44 and 45, all the believers were together and they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. It was love in action and it made an impression on that city of Jerusalem. Jesus' statement, as I have loved you, so you must love one another, raises a couple of questions that we need to, to answer. First, how does Jesus love? Well, the scripture tells us that he loves unconditionally, that he loves sacrificially, that God made Christ, who had never sinned, to be an offering for our sin. He loves with forgiveness, and he loves eternally. Romans 8 tells us that there is nothing in all of creation that could ever and will ever separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Not only those, but he loves, his love is holy because he's holy. And we're to love each other like that, but how do we do that? You see, here's the, here's the way that we do that. Everyone who is a believer in Jesus, everyone who has been saved by Jesus, I'm assuming that's most of us here. But if, if that's the case for you, then you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 tells us that uh, our bodies are the temple for the Holy Spirit who lives in us. It was given to us by God. We don't belong to ourselves. We've been bought with a high price, the precious blood of Jesus Christ, our Savior. 
Therefore, we honor God with our bodies, with our lives, but the Holy Spirit lives in us, and by obeying the Holy Spirit who's in us through the word of God that's available to us, we can love like Jesus. That's the way that we truly, truly love. It doesn't stop there. The love of Jesus can work in our lives and show through us to to uh, love our neighbors, to love our coworkers, to love our classmates, to, to love the world out there. But that's not what we're talking about this morning. This evening, come back because Pastor Zach is going to follow up with the rest of Romans chapter 12. And that's what that is about. It's about loving those people outside of our walls. But specifically, we're talking about God's love displayed through us to love fellow believers. That love is so different and so unlike the love that we see in the world around us. It's it's a selfish flesh love that's self-centered, that's unforgiving, it's insincere. We know that scripture gives us a great definition of what love is. 1 Corinthians 13 tells us that love is patient. Love is kind. It doesn't envy, it doesn't boast, it's not proud. It does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking, it's not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always persevere, and love never fails. You see, we as humans, as people, even as Christians, we don't naturally love like 1 Corinthians 13. To love like that requires a change of heart that comes through a relationship with Jesus Christ. It comes as he becomes Lord and personal Savior of our lives, and something supernatural happens. If you're a follower of Jesus, you'll, you'll recognize this. Something supernaturally happens when we give our lives to Jesus, when we accept him and begin to follow him. Listen to what this verse says, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. It says, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desire. This is the only way that we can truly get this love one another thing down and get it right. So now we get to Romans chapter 12, starting at verse 9. And I already read part of the, that verse to you, the first part of that verse, but let's, let's follow along. Because what happens here is we, we've, we've got all these um, chapters that lead up to here. And even in chapter 12, at verse 9, something kind of changes. You notice kind of the rhythm uh, and the structure of how these verses, because what we have is like a number of, of ways that we can love bullet points, power-packed uh, ways that we can demonstrate and show love. So let's read through John, uh, Romans 12, 9 through 13. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection. Take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble. Keep on praying. And when God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. There's a whole list, a list of about 12 commands uh, that fit this whole command to start with of loving other people, really loving people. Other versions of the Bible say that love must be sincere, that it be genuine. The New King James says, let love be without hypocrisy. You see, it's not too different to know when love is sincere and genuine, and when it's not. It's not hard to notice that. We understand, we see that. Some of the phrases that we've heard, maybe you've even said, talk is cheap. Actions speak louder than words. Put your money where your mouth is. You can talk the talk, but can you, can you walk the walk? It's all about does, does our words and our lifestyle match up with our actions? Does it fit? These kinds of phrases remind us that people are keenly aware of a hypocrisy that's out there, and they love to point it out, especially to believers in Jesus. If it doesn't match up, they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna find every way that they can uh, to, to push blame. Genuine, sincere, real love is not just simply words that we say or emotions, 
but it manifests itself in actions and demonstration. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he, that he gave, he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him wouldn't perish but have eternal life. Romans 5, 8, God demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, he died for us. It's all about action. This is the love that Jesus had for us, and he, and he puts his love in us by the Holy Spirit. I love this uh, passage of scripture in, found in Ephesians chapter 3. It's Paul's prayer for the Ephesian church, and this is what it says, 316 to 19. I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit, and then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. We're talking about God's love and his love that is in us. And he goes on to say, may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. And then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. God's love for us is so great. His love can tra change and transform a life like in a moment. And that's what we're talking about today. You might have been following Jesus for, for just a, a few months, a few years, maybe a, a number of decades you've been following him. Is the love of Jesus full in your heart and in your life? Because he's given us this command to love. And there's a number of these things that I read for you in Romans chapter 12, and for the sake of time, I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna focus on one of those, and that is Romans chapter 12, verse 10, that says, take delight in honoring each other. The English Standard Version says, outdo one another in showing honor. Honor is a word that is not too popular these days. It's something that a lot of us don't really even fully understand. But when the, when the English Standard Version says, outdo one another in showing honor, it, it, it means to take the lead, to be the best, to set an example, to excel in this idea of showing honor. To honor is to think about or to consider or to take care of, to put value into something or someone as precious, to regard or trust them uh, with admiration and respect. We can understand honor more by the negative of what dishonor is. To dishonor someone is to treat them as common and ordinary with no value. The commandments tell us this in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy and Exodus, to honor your father and mother as the Lord your God commanded you and then you will live long, full life in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. It's a commandment that comes with a promise. Honor your father and mother. Philippians 2, 3 says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. It's thinking about other people before we think about ourselves. 1 Peter 2, 7 says, honor all people. And jumping ahead to Romans chapter 13, verse 7 and 8, give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then then honor. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. So it's all about putting others first. Honoring. In our relationships, in our families, in our friendships with other believers. We're to honor one another. What does it look like in a, in a, in a marriage relationship for a husband and wife to, to honor or to follow this step of outdoing each other and showing honor? What if the husband were to say, you know what, I'm going to make it my sole purpose to outdo my spouse in honoring her? And, and, and it's really not trying to get one up, it's really trying to get one down. And it's not putting yourself down, but it is saying, look, I'm going to make myself low so that you're elevated a little bit more. And what it says is this, to honor that person, for a husband to honor his wife, or a wife to honor their, her husband, is to say, I'm gonna think about you before I think about myself. I'm gonna consider you before I consider myself. I'm gonna take care of things that matter to you before I selfishly think about things that I'm gonna take care of for myself. And it's not that I don't matter anymore, it's, th it's that I'm thinking about you before I think about myself. And what if, in that marriage relationship, both of those people committed to doing that? And so he said, look, I'm gonna outdo you in showing honor, and I'm gonna do serve you this way, and I'm gonna love you this way. And she said, look, I'm not gonna let you outdo that. I'm gonna love you one, one better. You serve me, I'm gonna serve you better. 
Can you imagine what that relationship is going to look like? That's what we need in our relationships with each other here to show honor. So why is love in this verse called a debt? He said, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another because we're permanently in debt to Jesus for the love that he's poured out on us, the love that Paul was describing in Ephesians chapter three. The only way that we can begin to pay this debt of love is by, is by fulfilling our obligation to love others. And in turn, because Jesus' love will always be infinitely greater than ours. You see, the greatest compliment you could ever give Jesus, the greatest expression of gratitude is that you would love others as he has loved you, that you would treat others as he has treated you. Imagine showing somebody love and then them turning around and doing something completely different to somebody else. You see, he's treated us with love and forgiveness, kindness, mercy, and grace. And on the other hand, if you've experienced his love and his forgiveness, but you're not extending that to others, what does that look like? There's a, a, a parable in the Bible that uh, I, wanna, I wanna take a moment to read through. It's the parable of the unmerciful servant. And, and as we look at this parable, as we kinda close with this, I can't emphasize enough the amount of love that God has shown us and the amount of debt that we have been forgiven as a follower of Jesus. Matthew chapter 18, verse 21 to 35, says that Peter came up and said to him, to Jesus, Lord, how many times shall, I, shall my brother sin against me and I still forgive him? Up to seven times? And Jesus said to him, I, I do not say to you up to seven times, but 77 times. Some say 70 times seven. He's saying, look, don't, don't keep track. You just forgive. And Jesus goes on to tell a parable. He says, for this reason, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his slaves. And when he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. But since he did not have the means to repay, his master commanded that he be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had and repayment be made. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him saying, have patience with me and I will repay you everything. And the master of that slave felt compassion and he released him and forgave him of the debt. So if you haven't, if you haven't studied this, this parable a little bit, there's a couple of interesting facts here. This, this slave owned his master, owed his master 10,000 talents. And if you, if you read how much a talent is, a talent is a measure of money and a talent, one talent is worth 20 years wages. So this man owed his master 10,000 talents. When you do the math, how much is that? 200,000 years worth of wages. I don't even want to begin to put a dollar amount to this. But what this, is, what this is highlighting is that there is a huge, enormous debt that this servant owed his master. And what was his words to him? Be patient with me, just give me a little time and I'll pay everything back to you. No, he wasn't. There was no way he could do that. 200,000 Years of wages, if that was four, if that was somebody working for 50 years, like from the time they graduated high school till they were 68 and retired, 50 years, that would be the lifetime wages of 4,000 people. That's a lot of money that one guy owed this person. I don't know how he borrowed that much money, to be honest with you. But here he is, he's saying, look, I'll pay you back everything. And his master had compassion on him and released him and forgave him the debt. But let's read on. That slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him 100 denarii. A denarii is one day's wage. So he found a friend. He'd just been forgiven 200,000 years worth of wages of money. And now he goes and finds a friend who owes him 100 days worth of wages. And he says that he seized him and he began to choke him, saying, pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, have patience with me and I will repay you. You've heard that before. But he was unwilling and he went and threw him in prison until he would pay back what was owed. So when his fellow slaves heard and saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their master all that had happened. And then summoning him, his master said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his master moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he would repay all that was owed to him. And he said, my heavenly father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive your brother from his heart. Listen, we have been given love and we have been given enormous 
uh, forgiveness of a debt that we could not pay in our relationship with Jesus. Jesus Christ took your place on a cross. He shed his blood so that you could be forgiven and free, so that you could be, uh, experience his love in a great way, and so that you could then make a difference wherever, you, wherever you're at. Listen, to not experience his love and then share that love is very, very selfish. You think of this guy right here. He'd been, he'd been forgiven so very much, and that's us. That's us. We're in this place. A debt that there's no way that we could pay, and he forgave us of our debt. It's sufficient to say that this man was forgiven an incredible, astronomical amount of money that he was never going to pay in 200,000 years if he could live that long. And that's what God has done for us. He's forgiven us of our sins and he does not, does not hold it ever against us. And we're to be generous with our love and our forgiveness to everyone because of what Jesus has done for us. As the worship team comes, I wanna read a couple of scriptures in closing. First John 4, 19 to 21 says, we love each other because he first loved us. If someone says I love God but hates his fellow brother, that person is a liar. For if we don't love people we can see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? And he has given us this command, love, those who love God must also love their fellow believers. 1 John 4, 7 to 11, dear friends, let us continue to love one another. Let's really love one another. It's not just pretend to love. Let's love. For love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love others. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes with me. If you haven't experienced God's love and you haven't experienced forgiveness, you've not experienced the relief that comes from being forgiven a debt, like this man in this parable, it really is a picture of us in our relationship with God. To be forgiven of a debt like that, that you know that you never in a, thousand years of going to be able to pay. That's what he, Jesus is offering you today. Salvation, a free gift. Today, if you don't know Jesus, you don't have a relationship with him, you've not experienced his love and forgiveness, I want to give you an opportunity to respond and say, Pastor Jeff, I want that. So whether you're joining online or you're here in the room with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if that's you and you have not experienced this forgiveness and you're saying today, I want a relationship with Jesus. I want to be forgiven. Would you just raise your hand? Raise your hand and hold it up. Thank you. Anyone else? Father, I pray today that you would just pour your spirit into every person that's reaching out to you today by faith saying, Jesus, forgive me. Help me. Save me love me. I pray that you would pour your presence and your spirit, your power into their lives. May they sense in, in, a, in a supernatural way, God, just the, the, the burden lifting and uh, just freedom coming because they're free of their sin. Thank you, God, for salvation. That's a free gift. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for not giving up on us. And anyone that's reaching and calling out to you today, I know that you're saving them and forgiving them. In Jesus' name. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed today, you say, Pastor Jeff, this, this speaks to me today because as a believer, I would say I'm not loving truly the way that I need to. The description of how Jesus has loved me, I'm not, I'm not extending that to the people around me here. And you would say today, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you that there's some ways and places and times and things in your life that need to change and there's some things that need to need to happen in your life for you to love and you need the spirit and the presence of God in a new and a fresh way 
because there's no way that you can love without the presence of God in your life. And you're saying today, Pastor Jeff, that's me. I'm praying, I'm asking God to pour into me so that he can pour through me. If that's you this morning just saying this, this is speaking to me today. Anyone? Hands across the room. Father, I pray that your spirit would be poured out on us, that your love would so fill us, that we would experience your love growing deep into our hearts and lives. And God, not just for us to experience, but to flow through us. Help us to love the people around us with supernatural love so that we would be a fulfillment of all that you've designed us to be, living in family and relationship with each other. May this church be a witness and a testimony of your great love as we love one another. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, let's not be like this servant who doesn't consider the debt that he'd been forgiven. That should have changed his life and everybody around him. He should have left that place saying, I forgive you, I forgive you, I forgive you. And the rest of his life, to tell the story about this enormous debt that he'd been forgiven. How about that be our message? That as we walk out this place, we say, I forgive you. I love you. I forgive you. I love you. Listen, one and a, good one anothering doesn't happen just one hour on a Sunday morning. We need connection with other people. And this is what we've lost in the past year. Is opportunity to come together. And so I encourage you, find a group, a study, be in a class. Um, get together with people. Show hospitality. Open your home. Have, ha, when's the last time you had people over? You can, you can sit on opposite ends of the room and still be okay. But, but be in the lives of each other. That's, that's the call today. Let's love. Let's forgive. Let's be the church. Amen. God bless you.